you guys for uh, joining, joining in. I'm hoping that this can be more of a, a two-way conversation than just a lecture. So you all have the ability to speak and um, please feel free to jump in and ask questions or direct the uh, conversation in your own way. I guess we should start with um, what is all what is all the drama about? Um, yesterday, uh, I believe there was a um, CoinDesk article that came out around Trezor implementing something called the AOPP, which is Address Ownership Proof Protocol, and the the primary objective of the AOPP is to streamline compliance of FATF's travel rule, uh, especially as it relates to Switzerland, which uh, my understanding is the only jurisdiction that has currently codified the FATF's travel rule recommendations into law. Um, if you're unaware, the way the FATF works uh, since it's not a national body and it's not a legislative body is they create guidelines and suggestions. Um, these are, these are essentially unelected bureaucrats, um, who propose, um, best practices and measures that, that banks and other financial services should follow, uh, the, Perverted um, objective is to prevent money laundering. Um, so they came out with these suggestions, and Switzerland, I believe, is the only jurisdiction to have implemented these suggestions into into law. Uh, my understanding is the Netherlands also tried to implement um, into law, but was challenged in court and. Uh, it was challenged in court by the oldest Bitcoin exchange in the Netherlands, and they won that challenge. And so it's no longer a requirement of the Netherlands currently. So the AOPP is primarily focused on uh, Swiss uh, virtual asset service providers um, and Trezor, along with other non-custodial wallets at whatever point in time have uh, signed up and implemented this technology or this protocol. Um, so the, the article focused on Trezor, but as people looked further into it, they realized that it wasn't just Trezor, it was um, other wallets as well. So they have wallets down here. So Bitbox Trezor, Blue Wallet, Sparrow, Edge. Uh, I don't know what this is, Mount Pellerin, uh, Relay, and this. Um, once people s realized that this was more widespread than just Trezor, and it was it was kind of spread throughout the entire wallet uh, space, um, there was a very strong adverse reaction from from kind of normal on the ground Bitcoiners, uh, which was really nice to see. Um, kind of surprised at the reaction, um, but uh, the, the strong negative. Uh, response from users was, uh, well, what should have happened in my view, and, and it did happen, so that's good. Um, obviously, we wrote a thread about it, um, and we try. I tried not to point fingers at anyone or accuse anyone of anything, but I wanted to give, uh, you know, our reasoning uh, as to why we wouldn't be implementing the AOPP. Um, so... Let's just take first take a look at this AOPP, um, and and we can take a take a gander on on what kind of stuff is collected and how it how it looks. So if you can actually log into a demo account from Twenty One Analytics, which is the for profit company behind the AOPP, so you can go to testing twenty one analytics ch and the username is admin and the password is admin. And you can get a look at the type of uh, platform that 21 Analytics makes available to its, its customers. And its customers um, are regulated exchanges. 
primarily in Switzerland, but their, their goal is to be everywhere. Um, so you can look at transactions. I guess they, they support Tether and Ethereum and Litecoin, all the, all the stuff. Um, there's beneficiaries associated, uh, originator of the transaction, the amount of the transaction. And how do the um, beneficiary and originator get um, populated? Well, the, the exchange obviously is performing KYC. They have to do that. Um, again, KYC is one of those FATF recommended things that came out after September 11 and all countries around the world have uh, implemented a KYC procedure of one, one sort or another. Um, so they have the information about who you are. Um, and that they want is where it's going, right? So if you go under private wallets, you can see these proofs. So this person quote unquote, these are all demos by the way, you know, so this isn't real data. Um, this person, David Lopez is now, um, attributed to this address here. And there's a signed cryptographic proof to confirm that, um, in this example, David Lopez has had to put in his name and address. Uh, the unique identifier is, is, um, provided by the, by 21 analytics uh, in the message that they must sign. Uh, so, so what exactly is it that, that Trezor's done? If we go to Trezor's thread here, um, and I, I'm, I'm not picking on Trezor, uh, Trezor is the only main wallet that has decided to continue support of this, um, proposal, whereas blue wallet and sparrow wallet listened to the community and said, okay, you guys don't want this, then it's not going to go in we're taking it out. So both blue wallet and sparrow wallet should be should be applauded for listening to the, the community and their users. Trezor Wallet is holding firm and they believe that this is the best, um, best thing. So let's just look through their reasoning and, and why they believe this to be a net positive. Um, so their, their primary argument is that not supporting the AOPP will lead to helping the government to fence people on exchanges. Uh, their motivation to add direct support is exactly to keep the government from doing so. Well, I mean, we can we can break this down, but not supporting the draconian overreach by the government will help the government to fence people on exchanges. Well, the government is fencing people on exchanges anyway, right? They're doing that with or without Trezor. Trezor is implementing the technology that the government wants them to implement to, to create what I'm calling a, um, a, um, what's, how, how should I put it? Um, a compliant self custody pro, uh, protocol. So right now, um, prior to this AOPP, if you are a customer of a Swiss exchange, you have to go through a kind of annoying process whereby you use your wallet, whether it's Trezor, Samurai, Blue Wallet, Sparrow, whatever, to sign a message using the receive address that you want to receive to. Um, we've seen users do this in Samurai and I'm sure on, uh, you know, I'm sure Craig has seen it in Sparrow and, and Blue Wallet has seen it as well. AOPP streamlines this procedure instead of the user manually having to go in there and sign a message um the message gets signed automatically so it's i mean it, it's a relatively you know harmless appearing uh proposal it's just using the ability for bitcoin uh private keys to sign a message proving ownership of a public key uh the the the, the main issue as i see it is, and I, and I, you know, I wrote this in, in my thread, um, which I'll bring over on the screen. So the main issues that we have with this is that it undermines self custody by, by implementing something like this, which is a 
a solely a requirement of one jurisdiction, and it will be more in the future, but it's currently one jurisdiction I and mean, one small jurisdiction. Trezor is normalizing this concept of self-custody requiring permission and compliance. And up until 2019, this concept was absolutely foreign to, to Bitcoin. Yes, we already had KYC. Yes, all the on-ramps are regulated. All the, uh, the off-ramps are regulated. But the, the thought of having to provide cryptographic proof of your identity to a, spe a specific address um, was was no one talked about it, right? That That's brand new. So this isn't part of KYC. This is a whole other thing. Um, so we're seeing in real time the burden becoming... Um, the burden becoming stronger on users who want to self custody. Um, this is not going to be the only thing that happens. They don't, the FATF isn't going to just stop here. What's the, so, you know, as a wallet developer, you need to be thinking about what's the next regulation that we, we're not thinking of right now. Uh, and we have, we have glimmers as to what that's going to be based off of this regulation. You know, self custody is the most dangerous um thing to these regulators self-custody takes takes the bitcoin out of their realm of control into the user's realm of control it's truly the only way to become self-sovereign when using bitcoin is to have full and unfettered access to your coins so they haven't got rid of the ability to do that yet but they've put up the first they put up the first roadblock now aopp is like well Let's take that roadblock and make it less of a roadblock for users and make it easier for users. Let's put this regulation and this, this cumbersome activity that the user must do under the hood so they don't see it, so it's frictionless. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, that's the first step. Get it out of the way so people don't complain about it, whereas people should be complaining about it. Um, we believe that it reveals a weak immune system uh, in the space broadly, the fact that many developers without question implemented something like this, um, I think is, is not a strong, um, positive. I think it's good that they're walking back and, and removing support, but we need to be, you know, as developers, we need to be thinking extremely adversarially and realize, uh, that as non-custodial wallet developers, we're in a really special place, right? We, we're not VASPs. We have, there's no, there's no law or regulation that tells us how we must write this software. We can write the software however we want, provided it remains non-custodial. So we should be using that power to write software um, it, that truly maximizes a user self sovereignty, even if that means that it might be more inconvenient for a user, right? They might manually have to sign a message instead of having an automatic API driven uh, event around it. Um, that, I mean, it, tying a uh, so KYC in itself is already a major problem that we we argue on in Bitcoin, right? You're 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 taking. Um, the real world identity, um, regulated government issued identity and tying it to your Bitcoin economic activity. It's, it's not, it's not a great thing. And that's why we've always been very, very harsh on KYC and recommend that you migrate away from KYC services, uh, and start, uh, attempting to acquire your Bitcoin through non KYC means. This is taking that KYC a step further where you're now being required to provide a cryptographic proof that you are the, indeed the person where this Bitcoin is being uh, sent to, right? You're, you're proving, uh, again here, confirming cryptographically, so this cannot be um, forged, that David Lopez or whoever this person says that David Lopez at this address is the owner of this address here. So you're taking your KYC identity and associating, uh, associating it to this UTXO or address in a way that is impossible to say you didn't do that. And obviously we, we disagree. We, we don't think you should do that and think that this is a step 
again, a step too far. And it's not necessarily just this, it's what's the next step. Um, and I, you know, uh, Peter Todd had a good, um, good tweet about that next potential next step. And we'll, we'll jump over to that in a second. Um, again, we don't attribute malice to the people behind the AOPP itself or the developers who have implemented this into their software. This wasn't an, uh, an attempt to shame them. It wasn't an attempt to, to stir up drama or anything like that. Uh, we just wanted to lay out our reasoning for not implementing something like this and hope that it's convincing enough that other wallet developers go, actually, yeah, they may have, they make a good point. We didn't think about it that way. And now that we've thought about it in this new light, we're going to remove it too. Um, and again, I just end it here. Um, mentioning that users in hostile jurisdictions like Switzerland can still manually sign a message with their private key if they're intent on using hostile services in Switzerland. Um, again, there's no, there's no law that requires a Swiss citizen or a Dutch citizen or any other citizen to provide this information. The law is on the service provider, not the citizen. Right, the service provider has to has to uh, obtain this information or ask to obtain this in information from a citizen. The citizen has no obligation under law to provide it, um, and we, you know, we hope that the the customer base in this in these jurisdictions realize that hey, um, this other country doesn't have to do this. Let me sign up for an account on this exchange and avoid my local exchange because they're overbearing in their regulatory uh, environment. So they vote with their feet and go somewhere else. Uh, the easier you make this stuff with these protocols like AOPP, the less likely that's to happen because you've removed any friction from the process. Um, the other, the last thing I wanted to kind of make mention about is, um, where is AOPP was initiated by 21 analytics uh, with the support of shift crypto. I don't know what with the support of means, so we'll just ignore it for now, but 21 analytics is who came up with this, this API and this uh, protocol. Uh, who are 21 analytics? So if we jump over to 21 analytics, we see a team here, uh, Lucas, that chart, some other people. And this 21 analytics has a, has a product they're selling software and the software that they're selling is compliant software for exchanges uh, or any other um, uh, virtual asset service providers who need compliance. So this is a compliance software tool. So AOPP is a protocol that facilitates 21 analytics compliance tool that they're selling. This is a for-profit uh, operation. Now, again, we, we saw who is part of this company, CEO and founder, Lucas Betschart. If we go, if we go ahead and see, uh, back onto the AOPP, we have one other link to look at. We have supported by the Bitcoin Association, Switzerland. So if, if you're new in, in Bitcoin, you probably haven't heard of this, but they've been around for a long time, the Bitcoin Association in Switzerland. And one of the things that the Bitcoin Association in Switzerland did was actually lobby the Swiss government and help shape the rules around the travel rule. If we look at uh, that, that eventually became law. So if we look at the board of the Bitcoin Association in Switzerland, we see a, a familiar face, uh, Lucas Betschart again. So this association run by this person lobbied the Swiss government to enact certain regulatory regimes. The only country so far to do so in, in, in creating this, this rule that complies with the FATF guideline recommendation, this person has lobbied the government to enact this rule. The same person has created a for-profit piece of software to help solve the the issue of companies complying with this rule. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. It's, uh, it's a typical story of writing in legislation, a business plan for yourself. It's really, we see it all the time. And 
it's one of the many things that Bitcoin was was designed to disrupt. Um, we saw this really clearly in New York in 2013 or 14 when they created the bit license. So they create this this huge amount of regulatory burden in the bit license. Uh, and the primary person who created that legislation uh, and those regulations once passed left the regulator to form a consultancy designed to help you comply with those regulations and get the bit get one of the bit licenses. So again, it's a very common uh, story with these types of things, but I figured it was good to to put that association together. Bitcoin Association Switzerland run by Lucas, lobbies of government for uh, this compliance um, procedure that is required now by law. They create a software uh, in 21 Analytics to help companies who are now required by law to do this, in fact, do this. Um, very interesting indeed. So I, I said I would check out the um, tweet from Peter Todd on on how what we kind of think the next steps. I don't know how much he's tweeted in the last 24 hours, so this might take me a second. Is that, does anyone have any questions or, or anything? Nope. Okay, uh, so this is a, a thought experiment from Peter Todd. Um, the next step is to require that exchanges only allow fund withdrawal when all subsequent movements are also KYC'd. Uh, and he, he makes a note how this kills lightning. Um, and of course he says, do not comply. Nothing good will come from compliance, et cetera. So this, it's important here, this part here, if the next step towards, towards restricting self custody is that, um, the regulator of the exchange needs to verify not only where it's going in that next hop, right? That is controlled by you, but where uh, it came before and where it's going to go after. Um, I can see that as a, a real potential possibility. Uh, it's the, it's kind of the next step. Um, and the, the argument that this is just a simple message signing procedure, while true, it is just a simple message signing procedure what message are you signing and what's the intent of signing that message right and and, and this this is what comes down to uh, with our position is we won't allow our software to become a pipeline for mass surveillance as i put in my tweet thread uh the the act of signing a message isn't the problem uh the what is it you're signing and who are you signing it to and and why are you signing it is is really what it comes down to um so i think that's all really that i have to say uh i would love to take questions or love to to take comments from any of you guys and i'll open it up uh oh can i hop in please do uh, yeah, uh, thanks for holding this uh, discussion. I think this is very important to uh, bring into greater um, greater view among Bitcoiners. And as Peter Todd has pointed out in his tweet, uh, this was exactly the same thing uh, that came to my mind too, because as, you, as Peter said, and as you just said, uh, why not uh, also KYC all the subsequent addresses and hops, right? So this, this I think, uh, simply po uh, opens the door to uh, KYCing every addresses, uh, every transactions. And if you don't KYC your transaction, the last hop uh, that belongs to you uh, and the government will have your name and your address, it's going to simply uh, tax you money saying you didn't comply, so you got to pay some penalty. Uh, the last address belonged to you, but the next address is not KYC, so we will hold you accountable. 
I think this is really dangerous path to follow. You know, what, once this KYC in every addresses and every transaction starts, it, it just doesn't stop. Everything will be taxed, taxed and everything will be regulated. Everything will be surveilled. I, th I think this should stop at the beginning and a no wallet should make this easier uh, for exchanges uh, to demand from the users. Yeah, thank you, Turk. I, I mean, obviously, we agree. Um, it's a it's a very, very slippery slope. Um, you know, I, I actually said something along the lines um, to let me find it here to Elena, um, who is a one of the founders of Trezor. Um, Trezor has been has been adamant in um, defending this and Hold on, let me just try to find this for you guys. It was in a response to one of her, her uh, questions here. Well, maybe I can't find it. This, this thread has got out of control. Um, essentially, essentially what I was saying to her uh, is that up until uh, very recently, like I said earlier, up until very recently, this this concept of having to provide proof of ownership of an address was non-existent. Um, so the argument that KYC is a slippery slope, which we've been making for a long time, is okay. First, it's just it's just your name, or it's just your email. Then it's your email, and you need your social security number and your ID. And then it's a well, we need a selfie um, as well. And then we need a, a video selfie, looking left, look right, look up, look down. I mean, this is this is not me exaggerating. This is true. There's the 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 KYC procedure for many of these exchanges currently around the world are are, are more rigorous and more onerous than actually opening a bank account. You know, they go they go hard on the KYC. Uh, and now we're seeing the advent of providing cryptographic proof of your withdrawal addresses. This is brand new. This is no longer a slippery slope. This is a landslide. Um, so I think that you're absolutely right, Turk. That what uh, the next thing uh, is? It's not. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Um, and the 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 second point in my thread here about the immune system, my my fear is that because. This was so readily adopted and so so quick to be implemented in non custodial non custodial Bitcoin software. There's there's not there's not a huge deterrence to these regulators and the rule makers who are watching. Uh, they say, well, look, compliance was high. Uh, let's let's do the next thing, you know. And the next thing might just be right under the hood. It might just be part of that message signing. But what is it now that you're signing? Right? Are you signing? Um, you're, you know, not an address, maybe an XPUB. Are you signing, you know, next next 25 addresses in your wallet? Are you signing, you know, um, your IP address? Uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that you can sign and send over automatically without without um, there being that much friction involved. Um, so, so it's a very it is a slippery slope argument um, to be made. Uh, for this type of thing, and and we're seeing it in real time, and it's it's happening really fast. Yeah, I, I agree with the slippery slope. I mean, oh, oh, since we are uh, individually signing uh, individual addresses, why not just give the the watch watch wallet, or why not just give the watch only uh, wallet of our seed to to the exchange directly, so that they know each and every addresses that our seeds are capable of generating. And you know, automatically knowing that if an address has been generated from our seeds or not. I mean, I agree. I mean, if we start with uh, individually assigning our names and addresses to individual addresses, then the next step is probably going to be why not uh, assign our names and addresses to each and every possible addresses that our seeds capable of generating, and essentially turning this Bitcoin network into a surveillance network. Yeah. Well, this, you know, this is the problem um, with KYC in general is turning Bitcoin into a surveillance network. I mean, most people are entering the space at this point through regulated uh, exchanges or regulated entities. So the on ramps um, are, are for the most part, you know, you have BISC and you have, you know, have some other ways, home mining, uh, 
earning Bitcoin directly. You have ways of getting non-KYC Bitcoin, but by and large, the majority of people are entering the space uh, with KYC Bitcoin. Um, so the, the transaction graph already is highly correlated to, to um, real identities in terms of UTXOs. Now, of course, there's technologies that, you know, like, that, that um, can, can help mitigate this in the form of CoinJoin, so Whirlpool and Samurai Wallet and Sparrow. Um, that will help you break your tracks, right? It won't get rid of the, the KYC record, but it will help in any, any further UTXOs from the point of mixing won't be attributed to that KYC identity anymore. Um, but the majority of users aren't using CoinJoin. It's, it's only a small amount of users uh, in the grand scheme of things that are using CoinJoin. Um, so, so there's already, I would say the UTXO set already is highly, highly KYC'd. Uh, many, many people aren't taking steps to, to protect themselves. M many people don't even really realize it, to be honest with you. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely getting to that point where, and we've been saying this for a long time, that the, the state, the government, at least the U.S. government and, and the European governments, they're not going to, to just try to ban Bitcoin or, or do, uh, you know, say, Yo, you, you know, it's not allowed anymore and it's illegal to use and sell, et cetera. That, that, that makes no sense. They don't have to do that. When they've captured the on ramps and the off ramps, they have a, a, a strong grasp already. Um, and this is again why it's so important for non custodial software developers to be the counterweight to that. Because again, they can't compel software developers to write code a certain way and write features a certain way. They can compel money service businesses, they can compel. Uh, virtual asset service providers, they can compel um, people who, uh, you know, entities that are within their regulatory reach, but they can't compel a software developer who writes, who writes a Bitcoin wallet that is non-custodial to do something, right? We have the free, uh, we have the freedom to write whatever software we want. Uh, and I think we need to take that responsibility very seriously and, and keep in mind um, what we're legitimizing, what we're making possible in every feature that, in every decision that we make. And if it's not, if, if, if the feature or the decision is not upholding user sovereignty, um, then it should be, it should be reconsidered. And again, I'm, I'm very happy to see that, um, Sparrow Wallet and Blue Wallet both reconsidered their position on this and, and did so very quickly. Um, and it's, and the response from the, the wider community, uh, which I would say was one of gener generally outrage, um, came through. And I think that's really a, a positive sign. It's not really one that I was expecting when I made the tweet, I expected fully to be the bad guy again and have, you know, and, and have to defend you know, my assertions and, and, you know, the usual red wallet mean type of stuff. But I was pleasantly surprised that, that many people um, agreed with the sentiments. Um, what I was saying is like, obviously we are kind of all associating this primarily um, from a uh, user identity perspective, you know, associating our IDs with UCXOs and the blockchain um, which is quite um, worrying from a kind of sovereignty perspective. But actually, there's a kind of more subtle kind of aspect to this on the whole um, uh, the slippery slope that gets me. And that's the fact that um, as baked into part of the API, um, there is, is that you're signing something um, in conjunction with your third party and using your wallet software. And I think the thing that worries me most is... Um, is I think there's kind of very much next steps in people's minds is the idea of eventually moving to say like a multi-sig wallet where you actually share keys with an exchange or an external party. So you're still allowed in the future and it's seen as a kind of an okay uh, kind of compromise where users can hold enough keys that the exchange can't steal from them, 
that don't actually hold enough keys to send onwards into the Bitcoin network um, wherever they're happy to, you know, wherever they actually wish to go for in the future. And again, it's like once you've embedded an API process between the exchange and user's wallet and you've got that, then you can increment updates all in the background that aren't just about privacy, but they're actually about your control of UTXOs. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, I, I didn't identify that um, in, my, in my thread, but as, as we were speaking on this or the previous call, um, it crossed my mind that a, a multi-sig uh, type of option between you and your exchange uh, is definitely something that I can see happening down the pipeline. And um, in fact, making it a requirement of, of uh, compliance. Thanks, Max. Cheers. Uh, hi, I am arrived late. I, I have some question. I can question for you. Sure. Please, please go ahead. Uh, I have a samurai wallet, uh, like hot wallet, but a cold, cold wallet. I have a treasure. The them. I have surprise with this change. Yeah, I want to understand how it's the deal. Because I, uh, now I read it's in Switzerland and Netherlands. Uh, this, this change is uh, only for this change uh, stay in this country or is for everybody, every world. Oh, um, sure. The, oh, it's obligatory for all the people. How, how is the sure. so, 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 so here's what I'll say just sorry, immediately. Sorry, my English. No, no, no problem at all. No problem at all. I, I, I understand the question. Uh, I understand just fine. Um, so, so first of all, what I'll say is you don't need to freak out. You don't need to, you know, shoot your treasure and, um, get rid of it or anything like that immediately like this. Um, what Trezor has done has implemented this API from this Swiss company, um, 21 Analytics. Uh, so users of exchanges in Switzerland right now have to manually sign a message and provide that message to the exchange. What it means for Trezor users will be that they no longer have to manually do that step. It, the step happens automatically with uh, an API in the wallet that, that it gets uh, signed and sent automatically. Um, so it's true, uh, and I said this earlier in the call, but you came in late, that there's only one jurisdiction in the world that has taken the FATF guidance and put it into law, uh, and that's Switzerland. Other countries will happen eventually, um, and there'll be differences in the, in the law, but it will happen. But as of right now, it's only Switzerland. Um, the, the main issue is, uh, as Max pointed out, uh, and as we pointed out in previous, uh, in this call previously, that adding this, this communication into the wallet at, at such a fundamental layer between exchange and wallet, uh, is normalizing this concept that you need permission to self custody. And that's what people are so upset about. So even, even people who aren't impacted by this law, which is majority of people, um, they understand that it's not, the writing on the wall isn't good. And they don't want to be in the situation that the Swiss are in. Um, and that's where I think the, the anger is springing up and the fact that Trezor isn't fighting this, they're, they're facilitating this. So uh, you mentioned the Netherlands. The Netherlands was the second country that brought in a regulation. It wasn't law as far as I understand it. It was a regulation from the central bank stating that the Bitcoin exchanges had to implement this type of um, regulatory burden. And the oldest exchange in the Netherlands, BitTonic, um, did the opposite of what Trezor did. Trezor just, uh, accepted it and facilitated it where Bitonic took, took it to court. 
and um, got that law or that regulation struck down because it wasn't it wasn't um, legal in the in the current aspects of Dutch privacy laws. Um, so so. Back to, um, Someone isn't muted and they're, they're going to give away information about themselves. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got it. I unmuted it. Um, okay. So, so that, that really is the, the main issue, Ernesto. So you don't have to worry. It's not like Trezor is sending out this information to, to people without your knowledge. Um, if you're not using one of these exchanges that requires you to, to prove, um, ownership of an address, then you, you don't really need to worry about it right now. I think that you, you should still consider not buying new Trezor products um, and instead supporting um, open source hardware wallets that, that have made a statement uh, to the fact that they're not going to support this. They're not going to legitimize this type of activity. I okay. hope that answered your question. No, see, yes. And, and because the pressure of the user uh, is possible, they can change his mind or they, 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 it, it's not possible now. Well, it, it appears to me that they, I mean, it's possible they can change their mind, but it appears to me uh, that they're not going to. Um, they've, they've provided some, what I believe are very weak, uh, excuses, uh, or, or justifications of this. And, um, you know, I think, I think when, when you see 131 quote tweets on, on the, uh, explanation, you know, that a ratio has happened and their users aren't, uh, accepting their justifications, but I believe that these are the justifications and, um, they're going to stick with it. I, I would hope that enough user pressure would would convince them that that um, users don't want this. Uh, but you know, they've made a decision and they're going to stick by it. It seems. Uh, but other other companies or other wallets in the space who made the decision to to implement this this protocol uh, have um, have turned back their support. So Blue Wallet and Sparrow Wallet yesterday both. Um, withdrew their support and uh, in the next versions of both of those wallets, that implementation will be removed. So, you know, consumer pressure does work. Um, Trezor maybe isn't subject to as much consumer pressure, uh, but if, if, they, if it's reflected in their bottom line, ultimately, if people stop buying Trezor products because of this, then, you know, maybe they will make a, make a change. Okay, thank you. And and uh, the last uh, question. Uh, I understand I use uh, Samurai as a hot wallet, but uh, if I compare cold wallet versus hot wallet, uh, cold wallet is better than than hot wallet or Samurai Samurai. Uh, can can win another called wallet. And so so some people prefer like you to keep um, a cold wallet or an offline wallet uh, for the majority of their their Bitcoin. Uh, that's totally understandable. Um, you know, Samurai isn't a isn't designed as a cold wallet. It's a it's a software wallet. It's a hot wallet. However, you can um, of course use uh, uh, something like Sentinel, which is a watch only wallet to to keep track of an offline wallet. So I don't have a hardware wallet, but I do have a cold wallet and I use Sentinel to keep track of it and to receive into it. Uh, and since it's a cold wallet, you don't do many transactions from it. Um, and I have a cold wallet and a hot wallet. So I mean, it, you know, the how you use Bitcoin, how you store your Bitcoin, it's going to be different for everyone. But you, you don't have to use a physical hardware wallet. It's just many people find that to be 
a, a nice, um, you know, a nice experience, a tactile experience, something they can hold in their hand, a piece of, a piece of hardware that they can hold. Uh, and I, you know, I recommend if you have one, like I said, you don't need to, you know, be reactive. You don't need to like shoot your Trezor wallet and then burn it or whatever. You can still use it. Um, it's still, it's still useful. Uh, but when you go to maybe buy a new one, uh, maybe choose something like foundation, uh, who, which has come out and said, look, we're not going to implement anything like this. This is outside of our, our realm of comfort and it's just not going to happen. So, you know, where they stand. And, you know, I, I made a, I made a couple tweets yesterday about the importance of red lines and knowing where your wallet developers stands on things. Um, and having these red lines that are unmovable. And in, in our cases, you know, those red lines are custodialism, KYC, and open source. Uh, so you know where we stand, or you should know where we stand on all issues just based off of our red lines. Uh, and we think, you know, wallet developers, especially non-custodial wallet developers, need to make those red lines clear and be held accountable to them by users. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing uh, with the reaction from from this AOPP. Thank you. You are very kind. Thanks, Ernesto. Hey, uh, Nick speaking. Just a question around that. So, yeah, obviously, we want developers to sort of yeah make a sort of stand at the ground um, against things like this. How do you guys as a company approach the high possibility that at some point in the future, uh, they may knock on your doors and they will consider you guys as facilitating, you know, private transactions, um, between what they would call unhosted wallets. Uh, understandably, it might not be something you'd want to go into, but, um, have you guys spent much time or investment, like figuring out how you would sit by these regulations and, uh, like minimize liability? Um, well, like even jurisdictional arbitrage, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, well, so first of all, the most important aspect to, to consider is the fact that in order for you to be, um, a money transmitter or a service provider or a, um, or any of those regulated activities, there's one thing that is common throughout all, all of those regulated activities, and that's that's custodialism. So if you take custody of a user's funds in any way for any amount of time, that's when you become subject to regulatory burden, as, as it, at least as it is written currently and has been for the majority of time that these laws have existed. So that's the main and fundamental reason why it's essential that anything that we do or any non-custodial wallet developer does remains truly non-custodial. Because as soon as you take custody, as soon as you take anything and you, you're a facilitator, as opposed to just writing software that a user is using. So a user, when they use Samurai Wallet, when they Whirlpool, when they, when they do anything, they're the ones that are facilitating their own transaction. They're the ones that are signing those, pri uh, those private keys. They're the ones that are initiating sets. Um, and making sure that you stay on that line protects you from all the regulatory burden that exists today. Now, if things change and for, for whatever reason, software developers are classified as, as facilitators, uh, well, one, in the U.S., there would be a major, major court battle about this. Because up until, you know, all, all case law points to software developers having a um, First Amendment right to their, their code, code of speech. Um, so it'd be an interesting legal battle. Uh, and this, to answer the second part of your question, yes, we've, we've thought about this rather considerably. Um, throughout 2020, we started moving our entire infrastructure to self-hosted uh, equivalents. So example, we're not on GitHub anymore. We're now a self-hosted GitLab. All of these, uh, all uh, the same with our support channels. All of this was because the centralized uh, points of failure like GitHub and, and others 
are, are choke points, right? They can deplatform you. You can say, hey, you have to get you have to get rid of this this project because you know they're um, you know uh, facilitating these criminal transactions, for example. Uh, they can't do that if you're self-hosting your own server with this information. So they, yes, we've thought about a lot about it. It's one of the essential reasons why the code uh, the code is open source and is out there. If anything happens, if regulatory environment changes, we're no longer able to provide software that that we want to provide without um, without um, you know doing something that crossing a red line that we won't cross. The code is there. Users can still run it. Someone else could could fork it and go completely underground, continue running the services. So you you know, it's it's a risk. We thought a lot about it. There is contingency plans in place, uh, but we I, I'm not personally convinced that we're going to see non custodial um, developers get regulated in the same way that a facilitator, a money service, a transmitter, or the SAP uh, are regulated. Thanks very much. That was re really interesting. Um, and yeah, it makes a lot of sense with the, the custody side of it. I guess with, with things like these laws where they're starting to say, uh, you know, you have to write down who you're withdrawing this money to, or you have to, like, uh, things along those lines, perhaps they'll... Um, enforce that on people who are so-called, you know, uh, not facilitating the transactions, but, um, you know, providing the, uh, the software to do so, maybe they'll extend those uh, regulations onto that. I, I could definitely see them doing that. I think, I think they'll try uh, eventually. Um, regulators going to regulate, you know, they're going to go as far as they can get away with. Um, I do think that in the U.S. or in, in any common law country, there would be a, a pretty serious fight um, on, on their hands. So, so they actually tried to do this, um, with the, uh, the EU tried to do this in the AML, uh, 5D. So the fifth money laundering directive and the original text of the fifth money laundering directive did make non-custodial wallets liable, uh, wallet developers liable and, and needing to, um, to conform to these, these types of regulations that normally would only uh, apply to money service transmitters. Um, by the time that the law or the regula regulation uh, got passed, that had been removed. So there's still, a, even in the EU, there's still an understanding that software developers are, are simply writing software and it's the users who are using it are, are doing things. And, and if it's an individual, um, they, they are not covered under um, these, these types of laws, these laws are, are applying to regulated entities, not just, in, not individuals. Uh, and, and I think that's going to continue for the most part, uh, in, within the next few years, I don't think they're going to go the extreme opposite direction and start targeting, um, individuals because the, the targeting of the on ramps has been so effective. Uh, as it is, they don't need to. They don't need to get draconian when when what they're doing is working pretty well for them. Uh, but but it is a slippery slope, like I said, and it's I, I I don't think you're wrong that they'll try and they'll continue to try. I do think that there's still fight those those fights will still be had. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, I thought um, as the developer of Sparrow Wallets, I should uh, um, uh, maybe jump in and, and uh, not try and defend um, the original decision of putting AOPP in, which is certainly, um, uh, you know, obviously not one that I, well, obviously one that I regret now. But uh, I thought, you know, many people are curious as to why I would have even considered such a thing in the first place. And I thought it might be interesting for me to um, relate that if it's helpful. Please do, Craig. And, and, I, and I hope that you didn't feel that we were targeting you or, or you know, trying to stir up a, a tempest in a teapot about you or anything like that. We were just trying to, you know, uh, get our point of view across and, and our thoughts on this. So uh, please, please go ahead and, and take as much time as you want. Sure. 
Um, so yeah, so I certainly didn't feel um, that that was uh, aimed at me. No. So uh, the, the, the reason that you know I was thinking about this, uh, and my thinking has moved on since this point. So I just wanted to explain how it was, in a historical sense, was that you know being able to get as many self-sovereign Bitcoiners as we can uh, is ultimately good for the Bitcoin network overall. Um, uh, you know. That's, that's kind of where I was at, and, and that's what led me to implement this, even though I was uncomfortable with it at the time. It sort of appeared from a technical point of view to be relatively benign, and it is only now that I fully appreciate um, just how insidious it can be to have this kind of creeping KYC. So, you know, where my thinking has moved to now is that we, we can't – we can't um, grow the Bitcoin network with Bitcoiners who don't care about the fundamentals of Bitcoin itself. Um, that we can't just grow at all, all costs. That we need to have Bitcoiners that not only care about privacy, but care about how Bitcoin works. Um, and that's, that's always been something pretty close to my heart. So, you know, it was really not thinking uh, through clearly enough at the time um, that led me to build this thing, thing in. Uh, it, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't sort of built in as a as a as a long sort of process. It, it actually happened pretty pretty fast, um, and then really it's just been a feature that I think has been never used. I've certainly never had any feedback on it at all until yesterday. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's kind of a just just to help people understand how it came came to, to be. It wasn't um, in a sense that I was. Uh, thinking that this should be some, some, some something that um, you know all wallets need to build in, it was really just a case of how can we encourage more self-sovereign Bitcoiners. Um, the, the 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 other thing that I wanted to mention um, was that um, you know if you provide a KYC a, a address to a KYC exchange, you are very much on the hook for whatever funds you send. Um, so regardless of whether you use a AOPP or not, I think that that's important for everyone to realize that, you know, it is the use of the KYC exchange in the first place that um, is going to, you know, put you on the hook for whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, the, the final point that I wanted to make on this is you know, I think that there – you know, certainly as open source developers, we have a specific burden um, to prevent the encroachment of any kind of KYC or regulation coming into Bitcoin. And I very much take that seriously. And I, as I said, very much regret implementing AOPP um, in the first place. But I think it's important that we don't just look at the developers. I think it's important that we look at Bitcoiners in general and see those who are you know, taking part or otherwise being, um, being, you know, funded or in some way abetted by the KYC industry, um, you know, and, and we, we don't just, uh, you know, focus on a certain segment of the Bitcoin community, but, but look, look at it all. So, yeah, th those are my, my thoughts. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions on that. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. And, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that, uh, especially on your second point, um, that it's not just the developers, it's the users um, and and uh, the the over, overwhelming acceptance of KYC procedures over the last 25 years uh, has. And so it's not just a Bitcoin problem. It's a, it's a bigger problem than Bitcoin. Um, you know, KYC has grown and grown and grown from its inception about 25 years ago. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the uh, point I was making in the, the first reasoning of, of my thread is that by wallet developers implementing something like this and putting it all under the hood and making it really easy and frictionless for the user, um, they're abstracting away what it is that's really going on. And, and instead of the user feeling um, annoyed and feeling like the process wasn't smooth and there has to be a better way and they go look for a better way, 
the compliance has been baked in, it's frictionless, no issue at all, and they don't even think about it. So I'd rather, I rather the user have to jump through extra hoops to sign a message and think about what they're doing versus just happening, happening automatically uh, to, to benefit, um, you know, a, a few exchanges in Switzerland currently. And, and I think the ironic thing is as, as a wallet developer, and I, I think you'd probably agree with me, Craig, is, you know, we would welcome a, a standardized um, BIP around uh, signing and verifying uh, messages because there is no there is no standard right now um, you know especially when you start getting into signing with uh, bash 32 addresses or public keys um, you know so a standard emerging around the the signing and verifying of messages I think is is a positive thing um, it's just not in this uh, <laughs> not in this capacity where it's being used as a way to um, to make it easier for Swiss exchanges to comply. We rather, you know, we rather see those Swiss exchanges um, fighting this as opposed and saying, "Hey, look, this is ruining the experience for our users." You know, here, you know, we're we're going to fight this just like the Dutch did in uh, with the tonic. But instead, and they may, you know, I don't know if if you guys were on the call earlier, but it goes back to the Bitcoin Association of Switzerland who lobbied heavily for this type of regulation in, in Switzerland is run by the same person that runs 21 Analytics, which sells the solution for this compliance. You know, so you're not gonna have someone on your, t on your team in Switzerland um, as a user when the, when the person who's supposed to be on your team is also selling the software to exchanges that make compliance easier for them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm you know, just just to add, this is certainly not the only um, the only time such a thing has crossed my desk. Um, you know, there have been plenty of other, um, uh, you know, proposals made to create some some sort of on-ramp and off-ramp rails. Um, <laughs> yes, you know, and and you know, for me. I can say now that that you know I very much have a line in the sand. It's it's much clearer to me now where I stand. I certainly will never again be going near anything like that. Uh, it certainly actually made it much easier to turn around to all those people who uh, are proposing such things and say, you know, that's not the way that Sparrow is certainly ever going to go. Um, so please take your request elsewhere. Um, but I, you know, it's it's uh, I think it's it's important to note that open source developers face a lot of pressure or at least a lot of um, financial encouragement to to sort of participate in these rails. Um, I certainly have never, uh, you know, AOPP was proposed to me in a, in a GitHub issue, which you can go and look up on Sparrow's GitHub, and, I, you know, I built it in a in a day or, day or two, and that was the sort of end of it. There was nothing further. Um, but uh, I've certainly had proposals from other organization since um, and I've always just felt that wasn't close to the Bitcoin ethos uh, it just didn't feel right to me uh, and and now I'm, I'm much actually clearer on um, on you know where I'm not going to go in the future yeah that's that's fantastic that's great and and I think that you know all, all wallet developers need to you know have that that come to Jesus moment really um, and and figure out where their line in the sand is and stick to it. And, you know, we're, again, I've said it a couple times on this call, but, you know, we were very happy to see that, that Sparrow um, made a decision to say, hey, you know, this isn't really in line, we're gonna remove it. And same with Blue Wallet. They said, this isn't really what uh, users want, so they're, they're gonna remove it. And, and as, as wallet developers, you will, we, we, we've been there as well. We get all sorts of requests all the time, tie into this system, implement this system, we'll pay you, you know, you'll, you, you, this will be an easy way for you to get funding. Da, 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 da. And, you know, we've had these red lines since, since we started Samurai. It's why we started Samurai, no KYC, no KYC adjacent. Like, a, you know, even if, even if it's a referral link from our, you, our, our app to your thing where you have to, where a user has to like provide any, any amount of KYC, we're not interested in it. We're not going to support it, do your own thing, but we're not going to facilitate it. Uh, and that's where we, you know, we have drawn our line in the sand. 
and you know not every wallet needs to draw their line right there some will you know some will be fine with uh, facilitating KYC onboarding in their app. Some will be fine with uh, KYC in general, um, but knowing where that line is, I think is essential for, for users so they can make an informed choice. And the, the importance of the Bitcoin wallet cannot be overstated. So they need to, you know, when making a choice of which wallet to use, they should know here's where the developers stand on these issues and I'm willing to accept or I'm not willing to accept this. So thank you for making it clear where you stand, Craig. Sure, absolutely. Any other questions from anyone else? Uh, can I ask another question? Of course you can. Yeah, uh, can you put the timeline into perspective a bit more? Because this seems to have uh, sprung up in a day, but you also say there has been this Switzerland stuff that this guy has been coordinating and then he created a 21 uh, something company that sells software to compliant exchanges. So I, I have a sense that this has been going on for a while, but has it been that the, vol the other wallets adopted this slowly and just yesterday Trezor adopted this and it blew up or can you put this thing a little bit, this issue, uh, the timeline into some perspective? Do you know about that? Uh, I know a little bit. Um, I believe so. The Bitcoin Association Switzerland um, has been a has been lobbying in Switzerland for uh, for a long time. This is an old organization. I think it goes back to 2014 or so. Lucas has been around the space for a long time. Um, the the lobbying around the specific travel rule uh, implementation I think dates back to around 2018, and the legislation I believe dates uh, dates to 2019. So we've started to see from Samurai Wallet users that um, some uh, mostly in Europe. Uh, that certain exchanges or um, uh, uh, dollar cost averaging kind of uh, services were requiring them to to nominate a address and then sign a message from that address, thereby proving that that person who was who was initiating the the service was in control of that address. Um, so that was around 2019. I think the the AOPP is more recent, probably um, earlier this uh, 2020, maybe early 2020, as a method uh, for for streamlining the process so that these services didn't have to explain to their users how to manually sign a message using a wallet, and the wallet would automatically do it. So it would it was just a I believe just a a method to to make compliance easier for the user um, was the AOPP, and I, I I don't know exactly when Trezor implemented it. I know people noticed yesterday, um, and that's where the big kind of um, the thread came from. Uh, was a CoinDesk article about this, um, but the requirement has existed in Switzerland since 2019. Uh, and, and you know, that's also why I, you know, I reject the notion that that implementing this is helping self custody because now these users are able to ex draw to ex ex uh, from off the exchange. They've been able to do that already since 2019. Uh, it's just been harder for them to sign, you know, quote unquote harder because they've had to sign a message manually uh, as opposed to your wallet signing a message automatically and transmitting it to, um, you know, this AOPP or 21 Analytics software all right thanks so this thing uh, this whole thing blew up because an open source uh software uh wallet uh, has implemented this and it was visible uh out in the open but uh, we can also assume that this kind of uh address signing has been already incorporated into the wallets of uh, closed source exchanges uh, for for since 2019 i guess would you say that 
Well, uh, some, yeah, you know, uh, Swiss Swiss uh, entities um, by law have to re have to request this information from the user. Um, the user doesn't have to provide it. Uh, if they don't provide it, they can't use the service. Um, I've noticed that there have been some some services based in Europe, for example, in Germany, that have also required users to provide a signed message. This is not under law. Um, this is just that service over complying. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the culture of over compliance is, a, is its own issue. It's its own problem. Um, but, but since 2019 in Switzerland, if you're buying from an exchange, you have to provide um, proof that you, you control the, the address that the funds are being sent to. I get it. Thanks. And if, if Craig is still listening, maybe I, I, I should ask him a question. Craig, can you tell me that when did you implement uh, this thing into Sparrow Wallet and uh, when did you remove this thing from the Sparrow Wallet? Yes, yeah, sure. It was implemented in May uh, 2021 uh, and it was removed last night, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the timeline. Right. Thanks. It's much more clearer now. Thank you. Sure. Well, guys, if there's no other questions, uh, I think we can wrap this up. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you all. Oh, I, I see a message. Hold on. Um, Competes Act. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, so the question from DC 786 is, does the proposed Competes Act impact wallet services that use centralized servers? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I need to look at the, uh, I need to look at the, the legislation or the proposed legislation. I'll have a look at that though. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Just look through the chat here, make sure there's no questions that I missed. Uh, looks like we're okay. I'll put this recording on YouTube if everyone is okay who's 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 uh, talked in this um, recording. If they're okay with me putting it on YouTube, if someone is not okay with me putting it on YouTube, just message me and, and tell me. Um, thank you for participating. I hope that it was useful for you guys, and. Uh, We'll see you in the chats. Thank you.